Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our sixth session on the tafsir of Surah Fatir, which is the 35th surah of the Quran. Uh, before we begin, just to quickly recap, Surah Fatir is a, uh, a surah that was revealed during the, the middle of the Meccan period. And, and therefore, it is considered a Meccan surah. And we know that Meccan surahs uh, speak uh, largely about the topic of uh, topics related to theology. And you find that this surah focuses on the oneness of, of God, his omnipotence, his omniscience, him being the creator of that which is visible and that which is unseen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not he's not only the the only creator but he is the the only one who provides and sustains and he sustains us he sustains us physically and spiritually you know he also provides guidance in the forms of prophets and messengers and the previous verses spoke about the the end the ultimate end of those who accept this guidance this divine guidance and the consequences of rejecting uh, divine guidance and we've reached uh, verse number 11 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wallahu khalaqakum min turabin thumma min nutfatin thumma ja'alakum azwajan وَمَا تَحْمِلُ مِنْ أُنْثَى وَلَا تَضَعُ إِلَّا بِعِلْمِ وَمَا يُعَمَّرُ مِنْ مُعَمَّرٍ وَلَا يُنْقَصُ مِنْ عُمُرِهِ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ God created you from dust, then from a drop. Then he made you pairs, and no female conceives nor does she give birth except with his knowledge. And no aged person is granted additional life, nor is his lifespan lessened, but that it is in a book. Indeed, that is easy for God. If you look at the first part of this verse, God created you from dust, then from a drop. Wallahu khalaqakum. There are two things for us to reflect on here. And that is, number one, this highlights the fact that Allah created us from dust or from a drop. Highlights, on the one hand, that Allah Azza wa Jal is all-powerful. You know, dust is an inanimate object. Allah Azza wa Jal has the power to create the animate from the inanimate. He's able to create this sophisticated, you know, sentient, multicellular organism, this rational organism from dirt. So on the one hand, this verse speaks to the the omnipotence of the Creator. And on the other hand, it reminds us, human beings, of our lowly origins, that, that we come from something that doesn't even have value in our eyes. You know, dirt, a drop of, of, of semen is something that is, you know, repugnant and disgusting to, to most, you know, most people find it to be uh, something that is, uh, that is repulsive. So Allah created man, he created human beings from a lowly origin. So it highlights God's omnipotence and it also underlines our lowly origins. Now, there's a discussion among scholars regarding uh, the, our creation, our origin from Turab, our origin from dirt, and our origin from, from semen. Now, dust, 
Our creation from dust is understood by many scholars to be a reference to the creation of Adam. Because Adam السلام, was created directly from the earth. Subsequent human beings, you know, his, his children and all human beings after that were created from a drop of semen. They were created from nutfa. So Torah is considered our distant origin. And semen and this drop, this nutfa is considered to be our proximate origin. So, and something, and there's a debate between scholars. Some scholars have said that, you know, Wallahu khalaqakum min turab, that God created you from, from dirt, applies to all human beings, not just Adam. Because if you look at the, the composition of the human body, all of the elements found within the human body are found in the earth. They're from the earth. Everything that we are made of, everything that we consume for nutrition, for, for uh, you know, to allow our bodies to grow, is from the earth. So Allah did create us um, from the earth. He nourishes us from the earth. And he created us from, uh, from a drop and so on and so forth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, his power doesn't, and there, you know, not only did he create the animate from the inanimate, he also created the human being in pairs, meaning male and female. And this is to, to allow them to procreate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has built human beings in a way where they themselves can procreate. And this is, of course, you know, another sign of, uh, of the creator's uh, omnipotence. Now, we mentioned that Wallahu khalaqakum min turab thumma min that God creating us from dirt and from a, a drop of semen is a reminder of our lowly origins. But this is with respect to our physical creation. Our physical creation has humble and lowly origins. And therefore, it should always re remind us and be a lesson for us to remain humble. You know, when we walk on the earth, we, you know, we step on this dirt. You know, this dirt is below our feet. You know, if someone gets a drop of, of semen on them, the first thing that you're, you're going to want to do is go wash your clothes because it's something that you deem to be unclean. This is, this is, these are the substances from which we were created. So our physical creation has come from, has emerged from that which you and I deem to be lowly. Now, but the human being is, is much more than a physical entity. There's much more to the human being than his physical reality. So with respect to our physical creation, yes, we were created from lowly substances. But the human being is a soul. We are, we are spiritual in our essence. We are having a physical experience in this earthly life, but our essence, our true nature, our true identity is spiritual. And you see that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands angels to prostrate. Now angels are, they are sublime creatures. They are spiritually elevated beings purified beings, rational creatures. They are commanded to prostrate to the human being, to Adam, not when he becomes a fully formed human being, not, not when his physical creation is completed. Allah says, فَإِذَا سَوَيْتُ When I fashion him, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ 
the command to prostrate to Adam comes after Allah blows his spirit, the ruh, into him. So we are our the essence of the human being is that we're arwah. Now you notice that Allah says. And when I fashion him, meaning Adam, and blow into him, meaning Adam, my spirit. Now, why does Allah attribute the spirit to himself? Now, in many ahadith, there are many ahadith that speak about this. You can find it in uh, Usul al-Kafi. In many ahadith, the imams explain that God attributes many things to himself. Not because they are physically associated with him. So it's not that, you know, that the ruh is physically connected to God or it's a part of God. Allah doesn't have parts. So what does this mean? It means that Allah wants to confer honor on that thing. In this case, the ruh. Through its, spe through its special association with God. Just like we call Kaaba Baytullah, the house of God. Allah doesn't have a house. But it is called the house of God because Allah wants to honor it because it is the first place on earth that was established for the worship of God. Ibrahim is Khalilullah. Allah doesn't need friends. Allah doesn't have friends like you and I have friends. But Khalilullah is, Allah associates Ibrahim with him to confer honor upon him because of his obedience and his devotion to God. So, so our, our essence, which is the ruh, is something that is so sublime that Allah associates it with himself. It's from those higher worlds. It's not from Turab or dunya. Our identity, our true essence is not earthly. In fact, it is heavenly. It's the ruh. And the ruh is something that is, it's a creation of God, but it's so sublime and lofty that it is associated with God. So we are, so human beings are earthly in their physical nature, but we are heavenly in our, in our essence. Our essence is heavenly. So go back to the verse. وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ ثُمَّ جَعَلَكُمْ أَزْوَاجٍ He created you from dust, then from a drop. So this could mean we created you from dust with the creation of Adam. Then subsequent generations, people after Adam, they were created from a drop. That's you know one view. Then he made you pairs, male and female, to procreate. وَمَا تَحْمِلُ مِنْ أُنثَى وَلَا تَضَعُوا إِلَّا بِعِلْمٍ and no female conceives, nor does she give birth except with his knowledge. So two things here are mentioned. Conception. So Allah created us in pairs so we can procreate. Now, when this, when this happens, when a, a man and a woman, you know, conceive, so obviously it's the, it's the woman the female who conceives, and then after conception, there after nine months approximately, there is the delivery of this new human being. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says that conception and delivery is knowledge that is exclusive to Allah. And no female conceives, nor does she give birth except with his knowledge. Now there's a lot to, to say about this verse, but just one thing that I'd like to share with you is that, you know, today, brothers and sisters, we're, we're in the year 2020. You know, by any measure, we have, we have advanced, you know, in, our, in science and in technology. You know, we know more today about human beings and about nature and about the world around us than any period in history. It's the information age. We have all of this technology, yet even the most learned obstetrician will admit that knowing the exact day of conception is something that's nearly impossible. 
you know, when you go say that, you know, a woman is pregnant, they can give you an estimate. They could say that you're probably set eight weeks, seven, eight weeks, nine weeks. They might be able to estimate that maybe it was, you know, this day or that day. But no one can tell you, there is no device that can determine with 100% accuracy the precise day. Forget about hour, that's impossible. The minute, that's impossible. That even the day, they don't know. Why? Because sperm can live in a woman's body for up to five days. So this makes it impossible for for an obstetrician, for a gynecologist, for even a, a scientist to calculate exactly when conception occurred. We don't know. And I mean, if, if you think about it, it's fascinating. You would think that today we would have the tools, we would have the resources, we'd have the technology to be able to determine when this woman became pregnant. When did conception take place? We don't know. And of course, only Allah knows at the moment of conception whether it's going to be female or male or uh, whether it's going to be healthy or ill, whether it's going to become be righteous or, or, or wicked. This knowledge is with Allah. So conception, the, especially the, the time of conception, the day of conception, people don't know. Doctors can't tell you when exactly a female conceived. It's not only conception, even delivery. No doctor can tell you, you know, they can give you a due date, but they can't tell you exactly when this baby is going to be, is going to be delivered. They can't tell you exactly when. They could tell you, you know, even if they're able to tell you the day, can they tell you the exact hour, the exact minute? Only Allah knows. So even with delivery, precise prediction is, is basically uh, impossible. So Allah created the human being from dirt, then from a drop of sperm, and then he created them as mates. And then you have the discussion about conception and delivery and then Allah says okay so now there's this human being conception it's been delivered and no aged person is granted additional life nor is his lifespan lessened except that it is in a book and we'll speak about what is meant by book so here there is this there is a discussion about increasing one's lifespan or decreasing it. Now, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how long we will live because it's in his hands. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us some control over our lifespan. Meaning that our actions, the decisions that we make in life, impact our lifespan. Now, the final, the final number is known to Allah, but there is a range that is given to us. And of course, you know, the malaika they only know the range. They know that this person is destined to die between the age of forty and sixty, and therefore, you know, the angels of death. You know, and we'll speak about this shortly. They, you know, they wait to see, you know, if, if, if a person does a particular action, they're granted an extension. If not, then their, their souls are seized at an earlier time. Now, there is no deed that has more of an impact on a person's lifespan than Salatul Rahim, than maintaining ties with one's family and one's relatives. I'll just share uh, one hadith from Imam al-Sadiq where he says, مَا نَعْلَمُ شَيْئًا يَزِيدُ فِي الْعُمُرِ إِلَّا صِلَةَ الرَّحِمِ So Imam al-Sadiq is saying, saying it's, not, it's not just my opinion. 
He says, we do not know of anything that may increase one's lifespan like maintaining good relations with relatives. So Salatul Rahim, of course, there is reward for it in the Akhirah, but Salatul Rahim also has a positive impact even on your dunya. You know, one of the worldly benefits of Salatul Rahim is that Allah grants you a longer life. And of course, this can indirectly uh, impact your Akhirah. You know, you have more time and to do good. You have more time to, for example, repent and so on and so forth. Hatta, now to get now to understand how much of an impact Salatul Rahim has on our lifespan, the Imam says, Hatta in Rajula Yakunu Ajaluhu Thalath Sinim, Fayakunu Wasul and Lir Rahim, Fayazidullahu fi Umurihi Thalathina Sena, Fayajaluha Thalathan wa Thalathina Sena. It's amazing. The Imam says, it is so much so that a man's lifespan may have only three years left. So imagine a person, they only have three years left to live. Meaning their ajal has been conditionally decreed by Allah. That in three years, Malakul Mawt is going to come and seize your soul. But he maintains good relations with his relatives. Because of Salatul Rahim, God will increase his life to last for 30 years. The total will be 33 years. Thus, the appointed time for his death will be after 33 years. So imagine me, for example. I sever ties with my family. Or I'm, I'm not good at keeping in touch with my family. And because of that, let's say Allah, you know, from the moment of my birth, it has been decreed, you know, the angels are aware of it, the angels of death are aware of it, that I'm going to live between the ages of 30 and 60, or 30 and 70. And because I sever ties with my family, I'm going to die at 33. But then I, I decide that I'm going to get back in touch with my relatives. I'm going to do Salatul Rahim. So instead of three more years of life, Allah grants 30 more years on top of the three that's, that already re remains. So it's not an insignificant amount of time that is given to someone who maintains ties with their family. And then, of course, the opposite, the opposite is also true. وَيَكُونُ أَجَلُهُ ثَلَاثًا وَثَلَاثِينَ سَنَةً فَيَكُونُ قَاطِعًا لِلرَّحِمْ فَيَنْقُصُهُ اللَّهُ ثَلَاثِينَ سَنَةً and the opposite is true. You know, maybe someone, the full extent that they could live is another 33 years. But because they sever ties, Allah reduces their lifespan to only three years. So, so this is the drastic impact that Salatul Rahim can have on a person's lifespan. Now, all of this, what a woman conceives, the delivery date, how long we will live, all of this knowledge. Illa fi kitab. All of this knowledge is in a book. Now the question is, what is this book? Is it a physical book? No. So obviously we're not talking about a physical book. Some verses, and of course this, this is not a reference to the Qur'an, because the Quran doesn't mention, you know, you know, the time of conception of every female or the delivery date. No, this is not. This is this is a book that is not the Quran. So what is this book? So some verses in the Quran refer to this book as Kitab in Mubin. Of course, Quran is also called Kitab uh, Kitab in Mubin, but this book that contains all of the information about creation, past, present, future, everything, everything. Knowledge in its totality is preserved in this book. It's called Kitab in Mubin. Other Quranic verses refer to this book as al al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet. Now in, in Surah Al-An'am, 
verse 59. And this is a, a recommended verse that we recite in the second rak'ah of uh, Salat al-Ghufayla. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتُحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُوْ And with him are the keys of the unseen. None know them except him. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبِّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ and he knows what is on the land and in the sea. Not a leaf, not a single leaf falls, but he knows it. And no grain is there within the darkness of the earth, and no moist or dry thing, but that it is written in a clear book. So there's a book that contains knowledge of all things. So all of this information, all of this knowledge is preserved in a book. And of course, book is, is a metaphor. It's a type of record. And it exists in, that, in those higher worlds. Now, this knowledge is, of course, Allah is the only one who inherently possesses this knowledge. But it can be acquired by others partially or completely with Allah's permission. So for example, in Surah An-Naml, ayah number 40, this is the discussion between Sulaiman alayhi salam and uh, his, you know, his, uh, the people who are in his court. There are jinn there. But this is when he asks uh, to have the, the throne of Shiva, the throne of Bilqis, uh, brought to him from Seba, his wasi, his successor, it's mentioned in Ahadith, his successor, Asif, Asif uh, ibn Barkhiya, what does he say? Qala alladhi indahu ilmun min al kitab. The one who had some knowledge, ilmun min al kitab, this min is for tab'iyuf. The one who had some knowledge of the book, meaning that book, you know, that has wala ratbin wala yabisin illa fi kitab mubin, that book. The one who had some knowledge of that book. What ability did he have? Of course, knowledge is power, yes. The one who had some knowledge of the book said. I can bring it, meaning the throne of, of Bilqis, before you even blink your eye. Today, we don't have that type of technology. I don't think in a hundred years we'll have that type of technology. The one who had partial knowledge of that book had this type of wilaya over God's creation. They were able to they, they have this power. Are there people, are there certain servants of Allah that have complete knowledge of that book? Of course, even their complete knowledge of it is with Allah's permission. The answer is yes. In Surah Ar-Ra'ad, verse 43, وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَسْتَ مُرْسَلًا and those who reject you, those who disbelieve, say, you are not a messenger. Yeah. Oh, Muhammad, you're not a messenger. Allah, what does he say? Don't let their words hurt you, Ya Rasulullah. Qul, kafa billahi shaheedan bayni wa baynukum. It's sufficient that God is a witness between me and you. So if you don't believe that I'm a messenger of God, Allah knows that I'm his messenger. That's sufficient, but Allah, but there is another witness that is mentioned. Waman indahu ilmul kitab. Sufficient is God as witness between me and you, and the one who has knowledge of the book. Now, even Sunni Mufassirin, they say that this is a reference to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now they may debate over what it means to have ilmul kitab. Some of them say it means Quran. Even if you say Quran, well, this is another. Proof that the Hadith of Nabi Talib should have succeeded the Prophet because he had Ilm al-Kitab. In any case, but here, 
Ilm al-Kitab is the reference to what? To that book. So if Asaf ibn Barqiya had Ilm min al-Kitab and was able to bring the throne of Bilqis in a blinking of an eye, what type of ability has been given to Rasulullah, to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam al-Hassan, Imam al Hussein? They have this ability. But you notice they don't use that ability. Meaning, you know, you know, sometimes you have certain things that are given to you, but it's it's for 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 official use only. Right? You have a laptop, you have a car, you only allow allow to use it in a way that is that is uh, that is allowed by the one who issued you that laptop or that car. Allah has given this knowledge to his awliya, but it's for official use only. Ali ibn Abi Talib can't just use it for his own personal gain. And of course, he would never do so. So this is the kitab that we mean. It's this, the, where the knowledge of all things is, is stored. And some servants of Allah are granted partial access to it or total uh, access to it. So going back to the verse, Wallahu khalaqakum min turab and thumma min nutfa, thumma ja'alakum azwajan, that God created you from dust, then from a drop, then he made you pairs, and no female conceives, nor does she give birth except with his knowledge. So now we're speaking out. So we begin with God's power, then God's knowledge of all things. And of course, our lifespans are in his knowledge. And all of this information is in a book. And indeed, that is easy for Allah. So when Allah says, you know, that is easy for Allah. This doesn't mean that some things are hard for Him, but this happens to be easy. Everything is easy for Him. There is nothing that is difficult. Verse number 12. وَمَا يَسْتَوِ الْبَحْرَانِ هَذَا عَذْبٌ فُرَاتٌ سَائِغٌ شَرَابٌ وَهَذَا مِلْحٌ أُجَاجٌ وَمِنْ كُلٍ تَأْكُلُونَ لَحْمًا طَرِيًّا وَتَسْتَخْرِجُونَ حِلْيَةً تَلْبَسُونَهَا وَتَرَى الْفُلْكَ فِيهِ مَوَاخِرَ لِتَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ And not alike are the two bodies of water. One is fresh and sweet, palatable for drinking, and one is salty and bitter. And from each you eat tender meat and extract ornaments which you wear, and you see the ships plowing through them that you might seek of his bounty, and perhaps you will be grateful. Now, again, I don't want to go into the 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 apparent meaning of the verse because I think it's very understandable uh, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking literally about two seas you know two bodies of water fresh a fresh body of water and a, a, a salty body of water presumably it's possible but the mufassirin uh, you know Allama Tabatabai uh, among them believes that the two seas, the fresh body of water and the salty, uh, the salt water, the two seas is a metaphor for the believer and the disbeliever, the one who embraces the truth and the one who rejects the truth. Now, outwardly, they may produce similar benefits. You know, you might see someone. You know, a believer does good and the disbeliever also does some good. Just because what they produce is similar, you know, you get halal meat, halal fish from fresh water and from salt water. You can extract, you know, uh, pearls or, you know, things that have value from both of them. Now, just because their output is similar, does that mean that they're the same? One of the things that we see with fresh water and salt water, especially when two large bodies of water, one is salty and one is fresh, 
you know, when fresh water and salt water meet, meet in an estuary, I think that's how you pronounce it, they do not always mix very readily. So even though what they produce may seem similar outwardly, their essence is different. So we can't say that, oh, they're the same just because they, what they produce is similar. It's not just about what they produce. It's about their essence. So their essence is different. You know, and this is why in the hereafter, so, in, so you see salt water and fresh water, they don't mix because their, their properties are different. Similarly, Ahlul Jannah and the people of Jahannam, they cannot mix. You can't put them in the same place because they have conflicting natures. They have different natures. They cannot mix. And this is why the day of judgment is known as Yawm al the day of separation. So we should not be deceived in thinking that, that a mu'min and a kafir, they're, they're the same because, you know, I see a mu'min do, does good and a kafir also does good. The, the essence is also important. Where, you know, you know, the essence and the nature of a person is also important. Yulijul layla fin nahar, verse number 13. Yulijul layla fin nahar, wa yulijul nahara fin layl, wa sakhara shamsa wal kamara, kulnu yajri li ajalim musamma, tha likumullahu rabbukum lahul mulk, wal ladina tadruna min dunihi ma yam likuna min katmir. He makes the night pass into the day and makes the day pass into the night. And he has made the sun and moon subservient, each running for a term appointed. That is God, your Lord. To him belongs the sovereignty. As for those upon whom you call apart from him, they do not possess so much as the husk of a date stone. We take the blessing, we take many blessings for granted, but among the blessings that we take for granted is the ni'mah of day and night. How many of us have truly thanked Allah Azza wa Jal for the ni'mah of night and the, the ni'mah of day? You know, both of them need their own sajda of gratitude. We take them for granted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah, in surah 28 Ayah number 71, he poses a very important rhetorical question. Say to them, O Muhammad, have you considered if God made the night continuous until the day of resurrection? Imagine it's only night. The sun doesn't rise. What God other than Allah, other than God, could bring you light? Will you not then hear? Will you not then listen to the truth? And notice that when Allah mentions perpetual night, He says, will you not hear? Because when it's dark, your sense of hearing is enhanced. So here, this is kind of a, you know, an interesting uh, precision that we see in the Quran. That if night is continuous, will you not then hear? Because hearing, the sense of hearing is sharpened when, uh, when there's no light. And the following verse, Surah 28, Ayah 72. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ جَعَلَ Say, have you considered if God made for you the day continuous until the day of resurrection? What God other than God could bring you a night in which you may rest? You know, so this is also an indication that we shouldn't sleep during the day and stay awake at night. Nighttime is a time of sukun. It's a time of rest. Will you not then see Will you not see the ayat? Will you not see the signs of God? 
So this is a blessing, you know, it would, we would not, life would not, we would not be able to sustain life on earth <clears throat> if night was continuous or if day was continuous. So the alternation of day and night is one of the divine blessings that Allah has bestowed upon us. Of course, day and night is a function of the, you know, uh, the movement of the uh, the earth and the sun. And he has made the sun and the moon subservient. وَسَخَّرَ Subservient to who? Presumably human beings. Allah created the heavens and the earth. And he has made, made them subservient to أَشْرَفُ الْمَخْلُوقَاتِ to, the, to, the, the, to his crown and creation, which is the human being, which is the human race. And... You know, it's interesting that Allah is essentially tell us, telling us that I created you, I created the dunya for you. I didn't create you for the dunya. That the dunya is meant to serve you. But some of us, we decide to degrade ourselves and we become servants of the dunya. Allah says, I have made the sun and the moon subservient to you, yet we make ourselves subservient to this earthly life, to dunya. So in fact, everything in creation, in the universe, has been made subservient to human beings. And you find that even in the, you know, one of the philosophical theories uh, it's also, it's, you know, some scientists have adopted this. It's called the strong anthropic principle. And this, uh, this principle posits that the universe is fine-tuned to ensure that human beings exist and flourish. Meaning that everything in the universe is designed and it's positioned to ensure that life on this tiny little planet flourishes. Now, Allah says, "Kullu yajri li ajalim musamma." Like all, you know, like all creatures, the sun and the moon will also perish and die. They have an ajal. They have a a term. They run for a term that is appointed, meaning that they will expire. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says. And this is, I believe, in Surah 75. I forgot to put the reference. When Allah speaks about the collapse of the universe, the end of times, the end of this, this uh, the universe, Allah says, and when the sun, it's one of the signs of the day of judgment or the, 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 uh, the collapse of the cosmic system, Allah says, and when the sun and the moon are joined together, now this, there's actually scientific evidence for this. In approximately 5 billion years, so it's not going to happen in the near future, the sun will begin the helium burning process. You know, so instead of burning hydrogen and you know, undergoing the process of, uh, of nuclear uh, fission or fusion, I don't recall exactly. But, but when it runs out of hydrogen, the sun will start to burn helium. And it will turn into a red giant star. It will expand. Now, when the sun expands in its size, its outer layers, so it's going to be like a balloon that inflates and inflates. Scientists say that it will consume Mercury, Venus, and the moon, and even ultimately uh, and possibly the Earth. So here, literally, when the sun dies, when it becomes a red giant star, it will basically consume the moon. So it will become one with the moon. And this is possibly one of the meanings of That is God, your Lord, your Rabb. To him belong the sovereignty. So, you know, so even when Allah speaks about the death of the sun and the moon and the destruction of the breakdown of this cosmic system, he invokes, he evokes the, his rububiyyah. And the rububiyyah is the one who cherishes you, sustains you. Even in the collapse of the universe, 
and its subsequent restructuring, this is a sign of Allah's rububiyyah, his care for us. Because the, the universe is collapsing and it's being restructured. And all of this is being done to prepare Alam al Akhirah with all of its unique features and properties. Now, of course, human beings will have perished before this, but so when we're unconscious, when we're not there, when we have perished, this universe will be rearranged and restructured in preparation for Alam al Akhirah with, with its new laws, with its new uh, properties and features. And then at the end of the ayah, as for those whom upon whom you call apart from him, they do not possess so much as the husk of a date stone. Now, obviously, this phrase, this part of the ayah, it reaffirms Allah's absolute power by underlining the complete powerlessness of all of those things that we turn to other than him. And we'll conclude with, uh, with this verse, everything other than Allah is powerless in and of itself. Allah says they don't, they don't possess, they don't possess anything, they have nothing, they're powerless. They don't even have authority or sovereignty over a date stone. The pit of a date, they don't have power over it. In Surah 21, ayah number 73, Allah says, Inna min dun Allah. Indeed, those you invoke besides God, you know, whatever you see as an entity, as a system that you feel has independent power or can give you anything or protect you from harm, or afford, for, afford you a type of benefit, Allah says, ذباباً ولو اجتمعوا له. Indeed, those you invoke besides God will never create as much as a fly. We cannot even bring a single fly into existence. وَإِن يسلبهم, وَإِن يسلبهم and if the fly should snatch something from them, they could not recover it. Weak are the pursuer and the pursued. You know, it is said that there was a man who was sitting with Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, and as the Imam was speaking, there was a fly or a mosquito that was irritating him and he was trying to swat it away trying to trying to kill it he wasn't able to so he became so irritated that he asked the imam ya ibn rasulullah why did allah create these pesky these annoying uh, flies these insects the imam alayhi salam he said to him to make the proud and mighty feel weak of course the imam is speaking about one of the the reasons, of course, it has its own uh, place in the created order. But this is a lesson for us that we, even the most powerful tyrant has trouble killing a mosquito. It's a reminder of how powerless we are before this tiny creature of God. Uh, with that, we'll conclude our discussion for this evening. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Any questions or comments? You know what you just said about uh, about anything that you turn to being more powerless than uh, the husk of a date stone? Yeah. That, that was really interesting because basically if you think of it in context of what people can accomplish today you even think we have all these the science this machinery and everything but all of that is really being called as as, as powerless uh, compared to that much true very true and, and and i think especially with what we witnessed recently with uh with the pandemic 
you know, this is something that is is not even visible to the human eye, you know, uh, and it 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 has completely paralyzed the the world economy and all of these superpowers with their nuclear weapons and their and their you know robust you know uh, military uh, apparatus. They're completely they have been brought down to their knees, not by a fly, by a virus. A fly, at least you can see it. But something that they cannot even see has completely shattered them, brought them down to their knees. And this makes you wonder that, you know, this is what a, vi a little virus can do. Imagine, this is the power of a virus. Imagine the power of Jibra'il, the power of Mika'il, the, you know, the power of these angels whom Allah has given much more authority than this, you know, tiny little uh, virus. This is... This, it's a, this is an ibrah for us. This is a lesson for us. But unfortunately, you know, I, I fear that, you know, when this vaccine is released, you know, instead of being more humble and behaving more like human beings, people are going to become, you know, arrogant and we defeated this. I even remember a couple of months ago when the COVID cases in New York started to flatline, the governor, this Como guy, he said publicly that, you know, God did not do this, that the nurses and the doctors, they're the ones who deserve the credit. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, after all of this, someone to have the audacity to say that this was not God. We defeated this. We, you know, God did not flatten the line. We did because of our, you know, our knowledge and our determination and the efforts of healthcare, you know, providers and so on and so forth. Now, no one is denying that. You know, people sh people should be appreciated for their hard work, but why why this insistence on saying that this was not God? Ajib, look at the arrogance of the human being. I believe uh, you covered a verse uh, maybe a couple years ago about how even when we die and we go to the next world, and we, if we were to be given the chance to come back to this one, we would still persist in whatever we're doing. We wouldn't repent. Yeah, some some people. Some people, I mean, won't, you know, even after, even when, if they were to see Jahannam and then Allah sends them back, they'll go back to their old ways. It's something really you know, remarkable about, you know, the souls of some people, but they're just, you know, the fear tactics just doesn't work. You know, they, they'll, they'll continue to rebel and disobey, even if they're shown Jahannam, that even that would not be a deterrent. Uh, one thing I want to comment on was just about the origin from dust. Yeah. Um, just from a scientific perspective, every sure. atom that's in our body, that was also just dust at best 30 years before our, our birth because all of it was then turned into food or turned into animals in one form or another. I sense. So, like, everything was literally dust. Very true. And, and that's why many scholars are inclined to, to what you just said, that uh, we don't need to construe Wallahu khalaqakum min turab to be this singular event in the past related to the creation of Adam. Wallahu khalaqakum min turab, just as you said, it applies to all of us, you know, because the food that that we eat, it all, it all comes from the earth, you know, third, just like you said, you know, a few decades ago, it was literally... It was literally dust. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that that's that's a valid uh, interpretation of the uh, the ayah. And uh, there's one question uh, to, related to uh, the night being prolonged, or it's uh, wh why was Salat al Lail prescribed uh, to be during the night? Why was Salatul Layl? Now, when we ask why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed Salatul Layl to be at night as opposed to another time, we're essentially asking about an action of God. And Allah in the Quran, He says, لا يسألوا عما يفعل وهم يسألوا That we're not, we're not in a position to ask Allah why He does this or that unless... Of course, 
you know, because Allah has not revealed to us or the prophets or the imams have not mentioned why this prayer was legislated for this period of the of the day or the night. We don't know. You know, and, and I, I've mentioned this in some of my lectures that it's all speculation unless God himself tells us or someone who is appointed by God reveals to us the wisdom or the reason for that uh, for that ruling. You know, it, and I, I've mentioned before that we can't even, we don't even know why people do what they do, why people make certain decisions. Forget about God. We don't even know with certainty why people decide what they decide or do what they do. You know, the example that I give is that imagine, you know, it's Friday and you have a colleague who walks into the office and they're, we and they're wearing a hat. Why are they wearing a hat? Unless they themselves tell you why they're wearing a hat on Friday, it's, you're, it's a guessing game. It could be that they're wearing a hat because it's a fashion statement or they're wearing a hat for religious reasons or maybe they had a bad haircut. There are many possibilities and it's all speculation unless they themselves tell us why they're wearing it. So if, so if, if we don't even know why human beings do what they do or decide what they decide, when we speak about why Allah has commanded this or why he has prohibited this, we don't know. And we have to be okay with not knowing unless Allah shares the illa of the hukum, unless he shares the, the wisdom behind uh, such rulings. But, you know, if we were to guess, you know, you know, during the day, people are busy, you know, earning a livelihood. People, you know, people are awake at that time and there are more distractions during the day. And for someone to build a deep bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most ideal time for that is, you know, late at night, you know, a, a little bit before dawn when people are sleeping, there are less distractions. This is a time that is really ideal for someone to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one possible reason, but what is the absolute reason? We don't know. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he hasn't revealed that to us. I mean, I haven't come across any a hadith that mentions specifically why those 11 raka'ah were uh, legislated or they were they were recommended to perform at the, the, the last hours of the night. Allahu uh, There are a few different books that uh, I've, I've heard of, like um, related to the, um, the, the book of Allah right over here. Um, the, there's a book that apparently the imams passed down from generation to generation. Is I, I've heard very little about it, but are are these like referring to a similar thing, or are they? So so we we have we have some books that contain knowledge that is contained in that in that book that we've mentioned. You know, one of them is, is Mus'haf Fatima and Jama'a. So there are some physical books that were that are with the Ahlul Bayt, that are passed down from one Imam to another, that contain uh, knowledge that is from that book that has everything uh, recorded in it, that, that kind of existential uh, book. So Mus'haf Fatima, Al-Jami'ah, Al-Jif, all of these books uh, are in the possession of the Ahlul Bayt, and, and sometimes they, they would reveal that knowledge uh, to certain special uh, disciples of theirs, but yeah, they, they do have now. Of course, that the Mus'haf Fatima does not is not a reflection. It's not an exact reflection of everything that is in you know Al Lawh Al Mahfuz. It could be a part of it that's related to the future of of human beings. Because as we said in that book, that that book Al Lawh Al Mahfuz, everything is mentioned in there. But perhaps what is in Mus'haf Fatima or Al Jami'a are the things that relate to the, the, the future of insan, the future of human beings uh, on earth. So it would be a partial, uh, a part of what is contained in that Lawh uh, al-Mahfuz, that existential book. And, and how does the Lawh al-Mahfuz relate to the Ilm al-Ghayb that the Imams had? So the Imams, they have, they know they're able to know whenever they wish to know something. Now, some people, now there's some ignorant people that say, oh, so are you saying that they're like God? No, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his knowledge is 
presential knowledge. Allah doesn't learn anything or acquire knowledge. Knowledge is all with him. But the, ima- the knowledge that the imams are given is acquired knowledge. So if the imam wishes to know something, that knowledge is granted to him. Now, of course, the imams would only wish to know something if they see that there's a benefit in them knowing it. If it can bring them closer to Allah. If it's related to something that they need to know, that's when they would wish to know it. But the imams don't have a, a desire to know things that are not uh, that are not really that important, unless, of course, someone poses a question to them, and then they, you know, they would desire to know the answer, and then they would they would answer accordingly. So the imams have access. You know, it's just like, for example, I give you I give you access to a bank. I give you access to funds. Now that doesn't mean that you pull all of the funds. And let's say I give you access to a bank account that has unlimited funds. Just because you have access to unlimited funds, it doesn't mean that at this very moment, uh, you know, you can you can draw whatever you want. You, that, that all of it is with you. Whenever you desire, you can draw from it. This is the the relationship of uh, of the the knowledge of the imams and al-lawh al-mahfuz. They have access to it, and if the imam wishes to know. He can know, but that knowledge is ilm husuri. It is acquired knowledge, while the knowledge of God is presential knowledge. Does that make sense? Yeah, what you're describing almost sounds like a physical book that you can open it up and read a page from whenever you want it. Yeah, I mean it's it's like that, but it's of course it's not a it's not a physical book. But they have they have that type of they have access to that knowledge. Right, and and, uh, another question. Uh, This little. Uh, tangential, but um, in in Peshawar nights, uh, it, it says that our Malana Imam Ali said that he is better than Hazrat Adam because he was forbidden to eat wheat, uh, but he still did. While Imam Ali was allowed to eat wheat, but he never put a morsel of it in his mouth. Um, could could you maybe explain that a little bit? So this this narration is is in re- this is a narration that's uh, from Sa'sa ibn Sawhan. He was one of the companions of Imam Ali. This is a question that he posed to him when he was on his deathbed. And the Imam basically, he asked him, you know, who's better, you or Adam, Nuh, but he mentioned the prophets of Ulul Azm. And the Imam alayhi salam mentioned, you know, in the, initially he was reluctant to answer, but then Sa'a pressured him and the Imam answered. And basically he says that Adam was forbidden from eating from that tree. And he ate from that which was forbidden for him. Now, not forbidden in the legal sense, but Allah told him not to not to eat from it. Whereas Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib refrains even from things that are halal for him. Forget about things that are makru or haram. He refrains from that which is lawful. So because of that, you know, this is one of the indications that... Uh, that his spiritual rank is higher than Adam. But you don't even need to go into these details. Just the fact that, you know, in the eye of Mubahana, that he is, Allah says that, you know, that he is the, you know, you know, فَمَنْ حَجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِنْ فَقُلْتَ عَالَ وَنَدْعَ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ So Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is described in the Quran as the nafs of the Prophet, the soul of the Prophet. And we know that the soul of the Prophet is superior to the souls of all other Prophets. So if the soul of Ali equals the soul of the Prophet, that means the soul of Ali is superior to the souls of other Prophets. And this is this is what we believe. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. We'll, uh, so we will continue, inshallah, our discussion. Next week. I'm so sorry. I have to, I went a little bit over time. I have to sign off, but please keep me in your dua and we will reconvene uh, next week.